that film the, the tech team put up by accident this morning and, uh, because that was filmed five years ago. And they said, we'll flip it out, change it out. And I said, you know what, leave that up there because I've been thinking about where we are now. This past Tuesday was the church's 24th birthday. Right? 24 years ago, January 4th, 1998. Very first service in Bob and Ginger Boone's living room of all places. Who was there that very first Sunday besides myself? Yeah, I see some arms back here, yeah. And, and further back as well. I was thinking about how much has changed. We started in that living room on that given Sunday, and we began moving into different schools, schools for six years as we uh, traversed around and wore out our welcome in different times. Uh, I thought about how uh, ministries began to emerge and began to unfold. I thought about the imagery on, we saw here of uh, this bare land. There was simply a cow pasture and had been undeveloped from the day of creation until this building was built. And then the years in this building, this was a much smaller room to start with. It was expanded, just all the change. If you would ask me several years back, if we had live stream, I would have said no, but in the hill country, there's a Frio River and there's Guadalupe River. We don't have that. All of the changes happened. Now, I can't get my, my mind around it. That film was made when we were changing our name from Friendswood Community Church to the harbor. It, it's been this, uh, this continual change now for for 24 years and counting. And if you've been around, you know that this year will be a year of big change as well. Back in November, first Sunday, I said, there's, there's a new season coming. I'll be retiring in the second half of this year, sometime second half of 2022. I said, there's more news to come. They're moving pieces still, but there's more news to come early in January, and this is the day. Like, this is the day of the more news. There's change coming here. But I need to pause for a few minutes and teach on change because I know what some of you are thinking. Yeah, yeah, some of you in the room, you hear the word change and you go, let's go. Yeah, change is a good thing. You just anticipate this would be good, let's go. But I know there's some of you too that just the word change alone, there's a little catch in your spirit. Like, will this be good? Will this not be good? It's just kind of how either you've experienced life or been wired. So, so I want to teach a little bit about change, just a little bit and then tell you about what this change is gonna look like here for us. When I think about this life God created for us, change is inevitable, isn't it? And there's no way around it, it is inevitable. Ecclesiastes chapter three, verses one through eight came to mind for me. You'll recognize these for most of you. It says, for everything there's a season, a time for every activity under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to harvest a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build up, a time to cry and a time to laugh, a time to grieve and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace, a time to turn away, a time to search and a time to quit searching, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to mend, a time to be quiet and a time to speak a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. If I had a dollar for every time I had thought the thoughts or said the words, if I could just freeze this moment in time, so many times throughout my life there's been something that's so good, so sweet, I've thought if I could just freeze this moment. Have you ever thought that? I'm sure you have. Did it freeze? No, it never does, does it? It never does. If we can only freeze things as they are when they're so sweet, but, time, but change is inevitable. And change often stirs deep emotions. In verse 4 that I read, there's a time to cry and a time to laugh, a time to grieve and a time to dance. It often change, stirs deep emotions. Sometimes there's change that we celebrate. Marie and I have two sons, and at each of their births, we celebrated their, their coming into this world. We celebrated this is really, it's been bizarre now for, uh, soon be like 40 years before too long. Um, so one was born at 3.56 a.m., one was born at 3.01 a.m. And almost every year we have woken up right at the time that child was born on their birthday or just minutes before that. Now most of the time when I wake up middle of the night, it's, oh, here we go again. I'm, I'm going to be awake. But every single birthday that I've awakened and Marie has at 3.56 or right before, 301 right before we celebrate. I mean, to this day, we, we celebrate the, the, the birth and the lives of our sons. There's some things that we celebrate. 
Uh, maybe for you, it's, it's been uh, the dream job that you got. It, it's, it's a change, but it's a change that you, you celebrate. Maybe you made the varsity basketball team or the school play. Maybe a prodigal son or daughter has come home. There are things that, in change that we celebrate. But there are things that we grieve too, aren't there, in change? Dear, dear friend of ours, a couple of days back told us that, that today is the anniversary of her mother's death. And some years have passed. She always grieves the loss. But she said there's some years where the grief is much deeper. And she said I, on Friday, she said, I know this is one of those. I, I felt it all week. This is just one of those, grieving the loss of a loved one. Maybe just the loss of a friendship, a meaningful relationship, a loss of health, or a job, a loss of a dream that you realize will never be fulfilled. There's also a change that we grieve and celebrate. There's a lot more of those than I would have thought. So our two sons uh, growing through the years, um, both of them went off to college after high school and we took the first one off to college and there was some grieving there, but we still had one at home. So when it was time for the second one to go to college, then we had had 21 years from the birth of the first son to the, taking the second son to college. And so we, we had been grieving for weeks and then in more intensely for days. And then that day, it was just, it was a hard time for us. We knew it was good. He was ready for it in every way, spiritually and emotionally and every, every other way. But, but there was a sense that something was ending. You, you get it, don't you? When we actually turned and drove back home, man, the tears were flowing. I'm not a big crier. A lot of you seeing tears in my eyes, but, but tears were flowing. About halfway back, one of us said, what do you want to do tonight? And something flipped. And we looked at each other and we both said, we can do whatever we want. <laughs> and we can do whatever we want tomorrow and the next tomorrow. And the next. We, I mean, we are free. You know, we have this free life. And, and, that, and there was this mixture. And even to this day, there's this mixture of grieving and celebrating. As the years have gone on, it's, the grieving has become less because the years have passed and celebrating more. And we get to be close to them. They live close and all that. But there's some things that happen, some change, and we both grieve and celebrate those things. There's some change that results in anxiety or fear. I had a, a change of boss. In fact, I wrote about this man in Fully Alive in chapter one. Uh, there's a man named Jim Amix who was going to become my boss. And I knew him because he'd been my boss some years previous to that. And he was a brilliant man. His father had co-authored probably the most famous book, on reservoir engineering in the oil field out there. Brilliant man, and Jim was a chip off the old block and everything, but I'd worked for him before, and, and I loved his brilliance, but, but the, like, at that time, the people skills, leadership skills, the, the most vivid memory in my mind was I'd be working at my desk, and Jim would just walk in and sit down in the chair and just sit there. I mean, just sit there. I mean, he's still there. He hasn't said anything. The first time he was there, I finally said, uh, Jim, you want me to leave? He said, oh, no, you don't need to. He'd always have a cup of coffee. He'd be staring off at my ceiling, out the window. And I had five or 10 minutes, then he'd just leave. And this happened about every week or two, the entire time I worked for him. And so I'm thinking, he's brilliant. I love that. But the leadership side, the skill side, and, and then my anxiety was triggered because the man that, that I had been working for before he came, we had heard he was, he was horrible to work for, and they were wrong. He was the devil. <laughs> he was the worst than they said. And so I'm thinking about that. I'm thinking about this. And I wrote about him in Fully Alive too, without his name, but you can pick out what story is his. And so, uh, you know, I had this other boss coming with trepidations. And it was worse. And so now I have trepidations. I'm thinking it's going to be worse. And, and I write in Fully Alive, and Jim Amix became the man under whom I flourished the most because he'd grown. I mean, he had developed in so many ways, and I felt like I could, man, I could soar in this man's leadership then. But at the time, when I heard he was coming, there was this sense of anxiety and even some fear about what that might be like. Change often stirs deep emotions in us. So how do we navigate change? I'll give you three key things. People have written books on these things, but these are three things that have helped me. Above all, remember what will never change. Remember what will never change. First of all, Malachi 3, 6. I am the Lord and I do not change. Remember God himself never changes. Hebrews 3, 8 says Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So however clearly you knew him yesterday, 
if you had great clarity about his character and who he is and what he does, and you loved that, he's the same today, isn't he? And no matter how you and I feel tomorrow, maybe tomorrow's a lousy, rotten day, he is the same tomorrow, isn't he? And he always will be. And beyond my last breath on earth and your last breath on earth, he will still be the same one. He will never change. He is always the same. And I love this next one about him, Psalm 100, verse 5. His love, his unfailing love continues forever. His unfailing, it never fails, love continues forever. So you and I can't fully fathom how much he loved you yesterday. We can't. Maybe you, you were overwhelmed by the power and the beauty of it, but you still couldn't fathom how much he loved you yesterday. He loves you the same infinite amount today, and he will tomorrow, and the next day, and the next, and the next. And then finally, 1 Peter 1.25, the word of the Lord remains forever. You and I can open the pages today and tomorrow and the next and the next as long as we have breath. And the word of God will prove itself true every single time. If you and I want to get beyond the things that are maybe, I mean, this is the one place you and I can go where there are no maybes in it. The word of God remains forever. God, his love, his word never change. Second, we need to tend to our emotions. I used to say it's, emotions are like a, a flashing light on the dashboard, but we finally bought a new car two years ago. There are not any flashing lights. I, man, I got in the car one morning, and this message came up. It said, like, your right front tire is three pounds too low on pressure. I thought, whoa, like, when did they start doing this? Like, what will they think of next? You know, I've never had that before. I don't even like to check the pressure on tires, and it tells me now. You know, but, but the, the dashboard gives you messages and our, our emotions are the same way. Whatever emotion you're sensing, there's something behind that. It, when change is occurring, tend to your emotions. Sometimes the emotions are enjoyable ones and they're good ones and they're not slowing you down, holding you back. Sometimes they're difficult emotions. Sometimes it's the emotion of grief or anxiety or fear. And I would say when those become heavy, when difficult emotions weigh heavy, Talk with someone who can help you. Do not walk that journey by yourself. A trusted friend, a spiritual mentor, a pastor, a gifted counselor. When difficult emotions weigh heavy, talk with someone who can help. If, I, if we were a, like a shout out crowd, like if we had Ricky Bolin as a pastor, he's not my successor by the way, but if he were to be, You'd be going, yes, yeah, amen, right? <laughs> if we were a shout-out crowd, if, if I said to you, man, have you found it helps to talk to someone when heavy emotions are raining in your life? You would, there'd be a bunch of folks here saying, amen. I mean, that's, that's just, that's how God's wired us. When things weigh heavy, not to carry them all by ourselves. So we navigate change by remembering what will never change. We tend to our emotions when they get heavy. We share with somebody else. So change is coming to the harbor. And this is what I want to tell you in my remaining time. I want to tell you very briefly about, about my successor, about who he is. I want to tell you about the journey, at least an abbreviated part of the journey that led us to him coming. Then I want to tell you more about him. His name is Jeff Manis. He's 47 years old. He is the founding and senior, or they call it lead pastor, of Element Church in Cheyenne, Wyoming. It's a church that he started 14 years ago. It's about the same size as the harbor is. It's much, much like the harbor. And it's, he's been pastoring, leading that church for the last 14 years since he founded it. I have a picture of Jeff and his wife, Sabrina. Um, Sabrina, Marina, I've got to know both of them really well. And uh, she is an introvert. But if you've heard the phrase, still waters run deep, man, she is gold. And Jeff is gold as well. I have a picture of their family. They have four children. I can tell you just the names briefly. Mariah's on the left. She's getting married next month. Jada is the next one. She's a freshman in high school. And then Michaela is the next one. She's out of school working. And then Jonah is their son who's out of school and working as well. So a family of six. Uh, the, and I'll tell you a lot more about Jeff. Um, the journey that led to this point of Jeff coming really tracks back clearly five years ago. See, I've, 
I've always known that I'm just the first senior pastor of the harbor. I've always known that. And so five years ago on this month, I was turning 63 in that month, and I asked the board if we could spend the entire year studying succession of senior pastors in churches. So we spent the entire year, it was this deep dive trying to learn what people had done, what had worked, what had failed, why things had failed, why things had worked, and spent this entire year on it, the year of 2017. Then we moved it to the back burner. It was still there. It kind of it was staying warm. It was still there, but not a lot of action on that until September of 2020. And it was time to put it back on the front burner again. We began to get really detailed about who we are as a church and who God might call and characteristics and what was essential and what was preferred and what was not acceptable and spent a great bit of time around that. Knowing all along, we had, we had a leadership team of four four pastors, all of whom very, very capable, very competent, maybe would be the one God was calling. In that process, uh, Dana Aronson and Kevin Pate, they're on the board. They knew they were being considered. Both of them withdrew their names. They came to an honest place to say, you know what? I, I know what God's called me to. It's what I'm doing right now. He hasn't called me to be senior pastor, senior pastor of the harbor. Weston and Tim Geralds did not know they were being considered, so they couldn't pull their names out because they didn't know the names from the hat. So there was a lot of evaluation done there, and, and we have the highest regard for both of them. But it became clear to us, it seemed that God wasn't saying that one of them was the successor. And so Weston, as you know, has become, his title now is teaching pastor, as well as leading as, as well. And Tim Geralds, who texted me late last night, and we texted this morning and all, Tim had uh, I mean, uh, the brightest future here, but God called him to Mississippi, I mean, to a profound ministry over a jillion college students in Mississippi and everything. And so we learned, and this would take us you know, deep through 2021 before we would figure all that out. Uh, but we learned at some point then that, that the person would not be internal. We've been casting a net external as well. We've, we've got, man, by God's grace, some incredible contacts uh, in the Christian world of pastors. Partly through Ricky Bolden and Lee Strobel, but by Sunscape Ministries, they know hundreds of senior pastors. And through them, um, Pastor serve those thousands of pastors. We were casting the net out, had been doing that. So last March then, then Jeff and Sabrina and some of the kids came to the Bay Area just for a vacation time to visit Steve and Jane Shelby because Steve and Jane are his aunt and uncle. So they came here just for this visit. There's some conversation on the weekend about this, you know, we were in search mode for a senior pastor. I'll let Jeff tell you himself when he's here, like what all actually had preceded that, what happened on that weekend. But at the end of the weekend, he said to Steve, hey, could I submit my resume? And Steve and Jane think the world of Jeff and Sabrina and the kids, but I think Steve's response was kind of like, well, sure anyone can submit the resume, <laughs> kind of like that. And Jeff hadn't done one maybe ever. If he had, it had been at least 20 years ago, so he had to go home and write one. And so then he submitted it, and it came to us, and, and we, the board, were so prepared to graciously read it, but what are the odds? So I was already preparing my word in my mind, the right things to say to be very grace-filled and encouraging, but no. And so the resume was good. It was, it was, it was a good resume. And so we began to, as well as looking internally and still casting it externally, began to listen to, to some messages from Jeff, and, and then began to read some of his books, and... For a long time, we kept thinking, we're, we're going to find the fatal flaw. And we would read one more book, and the fatal flaw wasn't there. We'd hear one more message, fatal flaw wasn't there. There were more and more check marks. And at one point, Marie and I went out, we flew out west, and we spent two full days with Jeff and Sabrina. I, I just had to sit with them. I thought, it's one thing to preach. It's one thing to write books. But if you can sit with someone for a while, like just sit with them. We spent two days with them and some came back with really um, stirred by what God might be doing. They would then end up coming here for an entire week and spend that time with the board and, and the leadership team. And uh, soon after that, there were, there were um, infinite amount of time with Zoom and calls and text and references and all that. We, this, if you don't know us, we are thorough. Like if God says jump, like we will jump. But when he doesn't say jump, we are thorough. We are thorough. Every single stone, I can't say we turned over because we turned them over at least twice. Every single one. I spent, I spent hundreds of hours on this. 
the board apart from me, spent hundreds of hours on this. By the way, Stephen Jane, at the very beginning, like this wasn't a serious thing about Jeff. When it became serious, Stephen Jane recused themselves from all of the discussions, all the work for months. They, they were not part of any of that for months then. But, but the board, uh, apart from me, spent hundreds of hours, which is why at the harbor, like the board is charged with choosing a senior pastor. One, because the members have elected them to be on the board because they're people that have the DNA flowing through their veins of the harbor. They're people that have matured in Christ and they're people that love this place. But beyond that, they're people that will spend infinite hours at a time like this because I wouldn't dare ask someone to watch a couple of messages about someone and say, would you vote yes or no? Like, do you want him? Or read a book and vote yes or no? Be hundreds of hours into this. And uh, by, by the end of October, we came to a point of realizing that Jeff is going to be the guy God brings. At that point, I also realized I had not even told you I'd be retiring. <laughs> there were still several moving parts and everything, but we knew he was going to be the guy. And we began to wrestle about this and it became clear, crystal clear. There's some of you, pretty fair number of you, that you would, you would transition this better and up if you could hear I was going to retire and soak on that for a while, get used to that, and then hear this is the guy coming, then to hear it all at one time. Now, some of you would have been fine, but a bunch of you, I mean, there would be this, whoa, wait a minute. I can't tell you how many of you have come up and said, thank you for giving us a bunch of advance warning. I just telling us in advance so we can get used to that. And then they're the ones that go home every Sunday and say, I can't wait, please, God, <laughs> sooner, sooner, sooner. But there's some of you that need some time around this. And so the first Sunday in November, I said, um, I'll be retiring second half of 2022. And uh, there'll be some more news soon after the first of the year, which is th the time today to tell you about Jeff. And so that brings us to today. More about him, about his faith. This is deep, deep, genuine love for Jesus. He has this uh, very genuine, authentic, organic relationship that's it's tied up in, with prayer and journaling that's very organic for him. It's tied up in intense scripture reading. It's tied up. He actually, for some, quite some time, he, he will fast an hour every week. He'll fast a day every month. He'll fast a week every year. There's just this rhythm of him through many, many years now since he was, well, actually he met Christ early, but uh, God called him to be a pastor when he was maybe 20 years old. I mean, there, over the years, this is deep, deep, mature love for Jesus. And there's also, there's this, this, this bold faith to follow wherever God leads. In fact, when you, if you were to hear just the, the, uh, the bullets of their story, which that's what we had as a board. At first, there were a couple of board members that said, this guy may be reckless. Man, that was a, that was a pretty wild move. You get behind the story and you see how God led them and prompted them to the point of them having to have faith and say, we'll jump off the cliff because you told us to. And when, when we heard those stories, Marie and I thought, that, that's exactly what God did with us. Time and time again, there's this bold faith to follow when God says move, and go wherever God says to move in that. Um, Jeff also has this deep love for Christ's church. And it's the similar love to what we have here. There's this dual passion for people to come to meet Jesus because of the church, but not just meet Jesus, but grow deeply in love with Christ and be formed in Christ's likeness. There's both pictures of this, which matter so much to us. People are meeting Jesus and then growing in vibrant faith to become Christ-like here. He's a very gifted communicator. He's this passionate teacher. I've watched so many messages, every single one. There's got to be one someplace where I think that, that was a you know, that was a D. I didn't get anything out of that. I mean, every single one has mattered. Um, every single one has gripped me. He's a, a gifted writer. I'll tell you more about that. In leadership, he's a visionary leadership. Some of the things they've done, so unique. He's an innovator. He thinks outside the box. I'll give you just one example. He and Sabrina, who, again, she's, she's very introverted. They do a podcast. The name of the podcast, hold on to your seats, is The Naked Party Time. When we first heard that, we said, this could be a, a deal breaker right here. And then we learned that the, behind that was this the podcast. It's about being authentic and real and open. But they realized if they put that name on it, they would have all kinds of people listening. And they have. 
I'm from all over the world listening to them on this. And, and then as you get to know them, then you know they live out and they teach and they guide like the purest biblical sexuality off of the Naked Party Time podcast. Is that outside the box? Could you picture Marie and me doing that? <laughs> Not in a million years. But, but getting to know them and knowing, man, if you, you will meet them, you'll think, there's no way. Of course, by then you will have listened to the podcast a bunch of times. You'll go, way, yeah, that's what, that's what God's doing. That's what God's using. There's, there's this innovation and there's this willingness to, to move outside the box when God says, look here. Like, no one's done this before. At least not in the harbor, they haven't. <laughs> but this might really be used by me, Jeff, at the harbor. I've said this many times. Uh, this is God's church, isn't it? And you've known that. And, and I've known the entire time. I, I get to carry the mantle of the story God is writing in chapter one. I've known that for a long, long time. And so there's someone who's going to succeed me that will carry the mantle for chapter two, and God will be working through that person. And for many, many years, I can't say it went back to January 4th, 1998, but it couldn't have been too much beyond that. I've had this uh, passion and pleading that God would bring someone for chapter two through whom he could do so much more. And more people would meet Jesus and fall in love with him and be shaped more in his character. And I mean, that has been my burning passion. And through this process of succession, there's been this voice in the back of my mind, this sense of, but if, if the person you pick, God, if I can't see it, man, you're going to have to tell me to have more faith. And as it turns out with Jeff Manis, I see it in spades. And I am filled with joy and gratitude to God for that. That he is the one God's called. And what I see in chapter two is God's about to do more than he's ever done in chapter one. And, and there could be no greater joy than that for me. So this is what's coming. Um, today is Jeff's last day at Element. Tomorrow he'll be on the harbor payroll. But if you know, if you could imagine the effort to try to leave a church really well. A church our size, and you're the lead pastor who's touched lives and everything, and try to, to leave well in the amount of um, exhausting effort to do that well. If you've ever started a job with a big, big scope, you know how exhausting it is to start that and to do it well. And rather than have someone be exhausted leaving, exhausted when they start in a huge job here, the church, the board said, let's give them a sabbatical. January 10th to March 20th, just a sabbatical. I mean, well done, good and faithful servant. Like refuel, rest, recharge. Because when you start then on March 21st, first day in the building with us, then you'll be, you'll be fired up and be energized, ready to go. March 21st, first day in the building. March 27th, first day here with us on Sunday. And probably Jeff and I will be up here on stage together and you'll be hearing the story well, much more than the story unfolding in that. March 27th, his first Sunday to teach should be the last Sunday of April, April 24th. And then at, as this unfolds in the few months that follow, uh, we'll be transitioning teaching leadership and I'll retire second half of 2022. So Harbor, that's what's coming. And I could not be more excited. So change is inevitable and change is coming to the Harbor. So what do we do when we, when we have change? How do we navigate change? We fix our, our eyes on that which will never change. We continually fix our eyes on God, on his love, on his word. They will never change. Whenever you feel shaky, if any of this feels shaky to you, we, we look to that which will never change, God, his love, and his word. We tend to our emotions. So if you have some emotions, uh, I mean, the, the ones of celebration, just let them run and ride. If there's any, any part of grief in that or anxiety or that, anything else, if, they, if that gets to be heavy, talk with someone. Talk with someone and walk with someone in that. And then get to know Jeff. In fact, when this service is done, as you leave to the outside on, in both directions, we have three of his books available for you to purchase. I'll give you a quick snapshot of these three. The first is Because You're Called. It's for every, every Christ follower, every person well-written, inspiring, significant. I would, ur 
I would urge you all to read this one. The second I would tell you about is called My Declaration. This is written to men, for men. Men, you need to read this. I, mean, I, I get goosebumps thinking about what is in this book for us men here. My Declaration is out there. And then Jeff's most recent is actually a children's book that's titled How Much Does God Love Me? If you have children... We have a granddaughter about to turn six, like that age and, and younger. This is a great book about God for them. And so when service is done, you can actually get to know more about Jeff through his books, through his writing, and actually grow through that as well. And then the Harbor website at noon after the next service is done, which, by the way, please don't tell people entering in what I've told you. And 90% of you won't. The 10% of you will and ask God to forgive you and you'll be fine. <laughs> but I would just urge you, like, please don't let them, let me tell them, let them hear from me about it. Uh, so anyway, at noon today, when I'm done my time with them, then on our website, if you go there under About Us, there'll be a lot more info about Jeff. There'll be links that can take you to his messages. He has a jillion messages. We'll give you like two or three if you want a starting place. We would suggest those two or three. But you can start any place. There are a jillion messages there to watch. Um, and then on the podcast, we'll suggest two or three. I think we would we'd urge you to listen to the very first one. I think it's zero, 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 because they give the vision around uh, why they're doing the podcast. But you'll have access to that. More information on the website will be out there at noon. So change is coming, church, in and this, is, this has always been God's church. And friends, he loves this church. It blows me away. He utterly, utterly loves this church. And an expression of that is uh, now in Jeff Manis, his family coming here. Father in heaven, the final thing for us to do is, is to pray. Anytime there's change is to pray, Father. And my prayer today is once again to say thank you for your stunning love for the harbor and for the people of the harbor and for the Bay Area through the harbor. And thank you for the way you've grown and developed Jeff and Sabrina and their family. And uh, the, the Jeff you're bringing here, the Sabrina you're bringing here, with all you've poured into them and through them, all of their experience, all their scars, all their learnings. Thank you for who we are and where we are, Father. We're a church still hungry for you, hungry to know more and more of you, to be shaped increasingly by you. We're hungry for that, Father. And so as these days and weeks and months and then years unfold, Father, um, they unfold for us with wide open hearts, expectant hearts, grateful hearts, Father. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>